Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com. From St. Louis Public Radio. This is St. Louis on the Air. You know, HR was reaching out to SLS, confused about, you know, where are these nurses we thought we really needed them. And SLS said, oh, they had actually withdrawn the night prior. A health system had reached out to one of the nurses directly who had said, actually, I was never told about this assignment. Um, you were able to learn in these records requests that SLS's rates were just too high for hospitals to afford. How high were these rates and, and how did that affect morale for the people who were there just getting paid the normal wages? When we spoke with experts, they said that is an exorbitant amount um, to be spending per patient on these treatments. I'm Sarah Fenske. Last August, as the pandemic took yet another deadly turn, Missouri found help from an unusual source. The state inked a no-bid contract, ultimately worth more than $30 million, with a Texas company that was perhaps best known for building a portion of President Trump's wall on the Mexican border. Its part of the wall fell down. So what did the company do for all that money? Tessa Weinberg is a reporter with the Missouri Independent. She co-authored a detailed story looking into what this company was paid and what it did that was published by the nonprofit news site, as well as here at St. Louis Public Radio earlier this week. And she joins us today with more. Tessa Weinberg, welcome. Hi, thanks so much for having me. So Tessa, the company that Missouri contracted with is called Sullivan Land Services, or SLS. What did they tell Missouri they could do? Yeah, so SLS um, had reached out to the state and was pitching its services back in the summer um, when Missouri was being really hard hit by the Delta variant spread. This was back in July and August. And they were really touting all of its past work in other states. And they said, you know, we can bring in hundreds of healthcare staff to Missouri and really touted that they had hundreds of staff exclusive to them. Um, And some of their past work amid the pandemic had been um, in New York, in Texas, in California. And they were pointing to those examples. Um, But what they didn't share in some of those emails we had gotten was that even though they had constructed these field hospitals, like in New York, some of them cost tens of millions of dollars and then only served few patients. Um, And that seemed to be a theme across some of their work across the country. It's interesting to think of a company called Sullivan Land Services. And again, they'd been sort of active in in wall building. Was this a pandemic pivot that they got into, okay, temporary health care needs? Mm -hmm. Yeah, it appeared so. They're a Galveston, Texas-based company, and most of their prior work was in emergency and disaster response, like cleanup after floods and then construction. Um, And like you had mentioned, they had been um, awarded federal contracts to construct portions of the U.S.-Mexico border wall under President Donald Trump's administration. They had made headlines when a portion fell down under strong winds, um, and officials had pointed to concrete not being fully dry as the reason why. But then during the the pandemic, they had pivoted to healthcare response, and that was through things like the temporary staffing, building field hospitals, operating the antibody infusion sites, and things like that. Okay, so one of their promises for Missouri was that they were going to send hundreds of healthcare workers to Missouri hospitals, but many hospitals reported that personnel just didn't show up. What did your reporting find out about that? Yeah, um, the emails we had um, obtained through records requests had showed that um, there were hospitals that within the very first few weeks of the contract were already experiencing no-shows of staff. Um, There was one instance where the Freeman Health System in southwest Missouri, uh, their human resources officer had thought that, you know, they would be getting to um, intensive care unit nurses first thing Monday morning at 7.30 a.m., 
Um, and then the nurses didn't show up and the emails had showed the, um, you know, HR was reaching out to SLS confused about, you know, where are these nurses we thought we really needed them. And SLS said, oh, they had actually withdrawn the night prior. Um, and the health system had reached out to one of the nurses directly who had said, actually, I was never told about this assignment. And it had kind of led to this, you know, mix up. And the emails we received showed that the state health department had heard of other complaints as well from other hospital systems and that it was frustrating for SLS. They had an internal policy saying they wouldn't offer staff another position for six months if, unless they could prove you know, that there was a family emergency and that's why they either didn't get on the plane to come to Missouri or didn't show up. But it was a little unclear of just how often this was happening. Um, the Missouri Hospital Association and the emails, it indicated they had surveyed their members to get um, a sense and feedback of these issues, but they declined to chat with us about that. And SLS did not expound on you know how many times this had happened in Missouri. So ultimately, did they end up providing as much staffing as the state was looking for during that, uh, that August wave and September too, I guess? Yeah, so the contract ended up being in place from mid-August through November, and it definitely, at least on the staffing portion, seemed to have um, less use than the state initially thought. The state had initially allocated $15 million to go towards healthcare staffing, and they would be basically covering hospitals' costs up to a certain amount, and it was based on the hospital size, and then another $15 million for antibody infusion centers. And only about $4.5 million actually ended up being spent on covering staffing. Mm. And then the rest was shifted over to um, pay for basically more funding for these antibody infusion sites. Um, And ultimately, a little over 200 staff was sent to a little over 50 hospitals um, throughout the course of the contract. And I understand that that for those uh, staffers, um, you were able to learn in these records requests that SLS's rates were just too high for hospitals to afford. How high were these rates? And, And how did that affect morale for the people who were there just getting paid the normal wages? Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, SLS's rates, you know, basically after the state was getting outbid, it indicated in the emails by other states like California, um, Missouri agreed to raise the rates for some of these positions. Some of those raises, um, you know, they raised the rates by over 30%. And some of the nursing positions were over $200 an hour. Some of the the highest physician rates were over $500 an hour. Um, And the emails had indicated some of these hospitals, you know, had already said, we can't afford to pay those rates once the state funding runs out. Um, And the contract, in addition to hospitals, was also available to state agencies, which have also been really hard hit by staffing shortages. Um, And the Department of Mental Health was one example where they shared, you know, if our facilities take advantage of this contract, we're concerned it's really going to impact morale. And the um, then deputy director, who's now the director of the department, had written an email to the governor's office explaining that, you know, to bring on some of these nurses and home care aides that a facility in St. Joseph was requesting, it would cost over $1.8 million to do uh, when factoring in the mileage and the housing and all that would cost. Meanwhile, just to um, fund $3 an hour pay increases for facility staff would cost only $630,000 to do. And so that was kind of a clear example of how to bring in this short-term help, it was going to be pretty costly um, compared to funding maybe some of these more long-term pay increases that could help boost morale and prevent staff from leaving in the long term. So I understand the Department of Mental Health's director said that these kind of concerns about employee morale and some of these issues here, these have lessened now that the legislature has passed funding uh, to give raises to state employees. Is that a fair assessment at this point? Yeah, she had been stressing in an interview when we chatted that, you know, she was really raising those concerns about morale because that was, you know, back in September when it was unclear, you know, would this be a proposal the legislature would consider? And so, um, yeah, she said that now that the state legislature legislature has passed that supplemental funding bill, that will basically allow state departments to um, set raises for their employees. That's helped her feel less concerned about the morale. And that, she said, you know, SLS's staffing was really essential just to being able to keep some of these facilities open when they had hundreds of their own um, staff out sick or having to quarantine because of COVID cases. So this was costly (laughs) to bring in these workers. It was complicated, as you say, with that no-show issue. But in some cases, people really felt, okay, this is something that I I don't know if we could have done this without these extra 
extra workers. Mm -hmm, Definitely. Yeah. When it, you know, when it's been difficult for state agencies in particular to attract staff, when you're competing with employers who are able to maybe pay more than the state can, um, I think the temporary staff was crucial for them at that point, but they would like to maybe see that also paired with these long-term investments. So, you know, maybe the next crisis or the next pe- next pandemic, they won't be in the same position again. We're talking today to Tessa Weinberg. She's a reporter at the Missouri Independent, has done really good work digging into this $30 million uh, no-bid contract with a Texas company, uh, SLS. As you've mentioned, they also offered these monoclonal antibody clinics. Um, and you spoke with Kendra Holmes, who's with Affinia, um, about these clinics, and they had these clinics going on Affinia's site. What did she have to say about the work they were doing? Yeah, my colleague Betsy at the Documenting COVID-19 Project um, had spoken with Affinia Healthcare, and these sites um, seem to have much more success than the staffing portion of SLS's work. Um, They had basically six sites across the state that were providing monoclonal antibody infusion treatments, and these um, are supposed to help lessen, you know, the the severity of the sickness someone might have after testing positive for COVID. And, you know, people said that these treatments helped their patients kind of feel like a whole new person, um, that they saw patients who had these treatments didn't go on to have to have, um, you know, more intense care. Um, But there were some kind of um, hiccups where, for example, at Affinia Healthcare, um, they had to do some extra work rebranding some of the flyers SLS had made, um, and they chose to put their site in North St. Louis and had to rebrand them just really show Affinia Healthcare's logo and help the community know that, you know, this isn't just some outside company doing this, it's with trusted partners um, to help, you know, make people feel a little bit more comfortable Um, coming and taking these, uh, taking advantage of these new treatments. So ultimately, these treatments were a success, but the numbers are so high. So the state spent nearly $21 million on this. That's more than $5,600 per patient served. Is that a reasonable amount of money based on on what you and your co-author learned about this? Yeah, that was something where, um, you know, when we spoke with experts, they said that is an exorbitant amount um, to be spending per patient on these treatments. And part of it was just, you know, when you had these centers running and if they weren't hitting maximum capacity each day, then they weren't serving maybe as many patients as they potentially could. Um, In total, the six clinics ended up serving 3,688 patients. Um, And so it was a pretty high cost for the antibody treatments. Uh, treatment centers all in all, but the state, you know, did defend that cost. And they said, you know, that we can't really put a price tag on um, providing such an important treatment to 4,000 Missourians was kind of their response to that. So Affinia Healthcare is still doing these monoclonal antibody infusions, even though SLS and its staffers have now moved on. Are they doing okay without that support from SLS? Mm-hmm. Yeah, Affinia, Affinia Healthcare said they've actually um, been able to increase the number of patients they treat. They estimate they now treat between 36 to 40 patients a week compared to about the 10 to 12 a week they were doing back in the fall. Um, you know, providers who did take advantage of those sites did say, though, that, you know, now part of the issue is they don't have enough of the monoclonal antibodies to get to treat even more people that might be able to benefit from this. But that is something that the state doesn't have as much control over as those come directly from the federal government. Mm -hmm. Um, But where the state maybe could do more is providing some of this kind of long-term support to just help boost, um, you know, healthcare staffing and morale overall. And other states have been taking budget surpluses they have and, you know, directing those to the healthcare industry, trying to provide direct payments. And so those are some ways that um, providers have, you know, pointed to trying to just address those long-term issues that the healthcare industry is experiencing across the board. So, Tessa, we've been referring to this as a $30 million no-bid contract. I understand it's a little more open-ended. What do we know about how high the amount of this contract could go? And then who ends up ultimately paying the bill on this? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the contract, um, the portion basically for the hospitals and the antibody infusion centers, that ended already back um, in November 30th. But the portion that has continued has been the temporary staffing in the state health, mental health department facilities. Um, That's going on through March. So 
25 million was ultimately spent um, on the hospital staffing and infusion center sites. So far, SLS has been paid in total over 32 million through the state, um, and the final amount will probably be higher after the staffing and mental health facilities wraps up. Um, I did hear from the state health department today, though, that they have requested um, that the Federal Emergency Management Agency reimburse the costs of the entirety of the contract. Um, I'm still hoping to get more details on that, but so potentially the state will see those costs reimbursed um, after spending this money on the contract. So it was so interesting to hear about some of the nitty gritty details of this contract and how this all played out. Do you see any takeaways here? Is there something Missouri learned from this or maybe should have learned from it? Yeah, I mean, I definitely think from talking with providers and experts, um, you know, sometimes in moments of crisis, you you need that immediate help, and you're going to need to bring on outside healthcare staff to help fill in those gaps. Um, but they really stress that you know, even though those might be necessary, trying to invest in the long term in your staff and the workforce um, is essential. So you don't see this burnout or you don't hit maybe a crisis point and then don't have the necessary staff to be able to help. Um, And it was interesting, too, of this seemed to just be another example of how the state throughout the pandemic has really heavily relied on outside contractors or consulting firms to advise their response. Um, We saw with the vaccine rollout, they heavily relied on different consulting firms to advise them. And so this, I think, was just another example of the state, you know, pivoting to that. And I think we'll see if in the long term and maybe lessons learned from this pandemic is if they prepare uh, prayer that money spent on these outside consultants with real investments um, in the state's workforce as well. Well, Tessa Weinberg, thank you so much for joining us today and sharing about your reporting. Thanks so much for having me. And Tessa is a reporter for the Missouri Independent. You can find more of her reporting at MissouriIndependent.com. Also, that story is at stlpr.org. This episode was produced by Emily Woodbury with audio engineering and podcast design by Aaron Doerr. Our executive producer is Alex Hoyer. St. Louis on the Air is a production of St. Louis Public Radio. Understanding starts here. If you learned something new from today's episode, consider leaving us a review and rating on Apple Podcasts on the App Store. It's the easiest way to help people discover our show. We appreciate it. Thank you. St. Louis Public Radio is a member-supported service of the University of Missouri-St. Louis. Support comes from the Missouri Forest Products Association, honoring Arbor Day on April 26th with an ongoing commitment to sustainable stewardship and conservation of Missouri's forests. Choosewood.com.